A lot of the gold value in the world is stored through ETFs, but most people don't have the gold ETF, right? But what a lot of people do have is gold jewelry, right? Probably the main way that people interact with gold is through jewelry. That might be a similar case where Bitcoin becomes very institutionalized and financialized, but most people end up interacting with it through ornaments and inscriptions, a kind of art and more creative kind of stuff that they can flex. This episode is brought to you by Das London, Blockworks' number one institutional crypto conference where all the top institutions and people in crypto are going to be this March in London, what's becoming maybe the crypto hub of the world. I have a link in the show notes where you can learn more and also a discount code that will get you 20% off. So click the link, find out more, and I'll see you there. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lightspeed. Today, we're joined by Udi Wirthmeyer, who's a co-founder of Taproot Wizards. Udi, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Pumped to have you on. Love the sunglasses. Is that the look you do on every episode? This is the FTX sunglasses. I only wear them for Solana podcasts. Can you see it? I don't remember which side it is. One of these. Oh, we zoom in. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> those, are, those are nice. Do you have the uh, Do you have the FTX condoms? What, what does it say? Yeah. Uh, won't break I, your I'm, large liquidation. I'm wearing them all the time, I'm just, <laughs> just to be safe. <laughs> You're wearing one right now. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Um, I don't think most of our audience knows what Taproot Wizards is. Probably don't know what Ordinals is, inscriptions, etc. Um, Mert actually tweeted today that inscriptions are a global threat for all blockchains. We'll get, into that. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. I think it would be interesting to maybe start a little bit of history with your background, but really NFTs on Bitcoin, the history of that, and then we'll get to what Ordinals are. Yeah, look, I've been like a Bitcoin addict for like a good 10 years or whatever it was. Um kind of uh, before it was cool. <laughs> and um, I was just a nerd, right? Like I was a software developer. I was reading up on Bitcoin. I was like, hey, this sounds like really cool. And I had some, you know, run in in the past with my bank or whatever when I tried to do some wires and they're like, no, you can't do that. And I was like pissed. So it clicked for me. I was like, hey, this is money that I can use however I want, right? Um, so I became like a Bitcoin nerd. And I became known among my friends and colleagues as the annoying Bitcoin nerd who would keep <laughs> would keep rambling about stupid blockchain in 2013 or whatever it was. Um, but one thing um, that sadly uh, occurred was that I joined the uh, Bitcoin maximalist laser eye cult uh, fairly fairly early on in my journey, uh, and I was a full blown like cult member for many years. Uh, that's why I think like I, I love Mert's tweets mostly about like the Ethereum Maximus because I see like the same thing in them that I saw in myself being a cult member and they're like the cult members of of today and I find it hilarious. So I finally broke free of the cult uh, kind of, I don't know, the last couple of years. But before that, I was fading NFTs as, as hard as I possibly could. <laughs> like I was, I hated NFTs. I, I felt like they were attacking my well-being and my identity. And I was like, man, what? You, you guys need to buy Bitcoin. Why are you buying NFTs? And, and mind you, Bitcoin, NFTs did start on Bitcoin, yeah, technically. They didn't, they didn't become popular in Bitcoin, but they did start on Bitcoin um, with rare pippies and stuff like that and counterparty in whatever it was, 2014, 15. So I'm one of those rare people who faded, Bitcoin, uh, faded NFTs for seven years. <laughs> and I can find a lot of that. <laughs> but I have. And, um, and yeah, I think... You know, from my point of view, like I'm, you know, it is what it is. I'm more interested in Bitcoin. That's just life. But I think that um, one of the things that I've seen in is, is I've tr been trying to kind of onboard people into Bitcoin over those many years is that, you know, of course, most people just don't care. So they don't. But even when there's someone who clicks into the idea, um, one thing that it's always been difficult for people is self-custody, right? Like they're like, well, I'll buy some Bitcoin Coinbase or whatever, but I'm not going to move it to my own wallet. And what I've seen with NFTs, in, especially in 2021, 2022, is that people are so passionate about them that they're willing to jump through all the hoops to install MetaMask or Fun Phantom or whatever it is to, to understand seed phrases, to do all of that stuff just in order to play along. I was like, well, you know what? Maybe there's something there. Maybe like through NFTs, 
boomers like myself can teach people about why we think Bitcoin is cool too. And or for, at least for us, that's kind of how the idea behind Terraform Wizard started. We're like, okay, can we can we make NFTs that Bitcoiners care about, and that 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 Bitcoin people will be trying to trying out, and that that will help onboard people into Bitcoin. And it was kind of a wild thought, but I think it kind of worked. <laughs> I mean, in the last year, and we can't really take credit for this. Like, but the Ornals protocol is something that was invented by Casey Rotomore and it's just really cool. It works on Bitcoin. It allows you to issue JPEGs and other types of NFTs directly on the Bitcoin chain. I think what's special about them is that like, you know, unlike most NFTs on most chains, the data is on chain, so it's going to stay there forever. It's not going to change. Uh, it's not going to disappear. The rules are not going to change on you. The issuer cannot show up after a year and say, hey, actually, you can only trade on these two marketplaces, but the rest you can't trade on them because they don't have royalties or whatever. So it's very like strict and clear and you, 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 you see what you get. And I think in that sense, they're just cool. I don't know if they're better than Ethereum NFTs or Solana NFTs. I think they're different and they're different enough to be interesting. So, you know, that started. Um, and people have started using that kind of space that you can use to store JPEGs to also store other stuff. And, and one of the very popular things that people have been storing is JSON files, which is a little bit absurd, but it allows them to issue tokens, like they call them BRC20s, so tokens on Bitcoin. And they're like incredibly inefficient because they use JSON and that's like absolutely absurd. Like if you're a developer, you know, that's, that's a really stupid way to do things, to store JSON files on chain. But hey, it works and people do it. And I think that part of the reason that they, they've done so well is because they're so absurdly inefficient and stupid that so many people were fading them. <laughs> so it's part of that. It's part of the thing. And I want to get further into Taproot Wizards here in a second, but stepping back a little bit and describing the difference between ordinals, which maybe people have heard about versus inscriptions. Like today, inscriptions took down Arbitrum. What, what is the difference between those two and why did it take until today, I think ordinals took off in 2023. Why hadn't we seen those in the past? Yeah, um, so I, I guess strictly technically, um, ordinals is is kind of it's a way to track pseudo tokens throughout the Bitcoin system. They're not really tokens in the same way that they would be on other networks. You are essentially tracking sats which are the the smallest unit of a bitcoin throughout um throughout the network and throughout the chain and you're just assigning value to each sat you're saying okay this particular sat is going to be token x and this one is going to be token y and this one is going to be some nfts so ordinals is just in a, a protocol for for tracking them it's that's all it is it's it's um it's uh, interpreting pre-existing Bitcoin transactions. There's nothing special about other transactions. They're completely normal Bitcoin transactions. It's interpreting them in a way that will tell you which ordinal went to which address, basically, so that you can essentially have a token scheme on top of Bitcoin. Is that, would you need that? Just sorry to butt in here, but we're seeing inscriptions, which I know you'll describe here in a second, on uh, other networks like Ethereum, Avalanche, Arbitrum. Do they need a, a protocol like Ordinals as well? Is it because how the UTXO model is different from how those blockchains work? Do you not need that? Yeah, I would say that the other ones don't need that because they already have a native way to track tokens, right? So, you know, Solana has SPL20 and not SPL20, just SPL, right, is what it's called. And uh, sorry, and, uh, and and Ethereum has ERC twenty, and those are just native ways to track tokens. Um, and on Bitcoin, you don't have that, so it's just like it's kind of a hack to track the units of Bitcoin itself as as like a, an alternative to tokens. So I would say other networks probably don't need that component. Um, but they do use inscriptions. So inscriptions is um, a complement to ordinals, which is just a way to basically write arbitrary data into originally into the Bitcoin chain in any size. Usually, in the past, Bitcoin developers have tried to limit the kind of amount of, of arbitrary data you can write into the chain. And inscriptions kind of found a clever way around that. <laughs> so 
you know, and what, what we did with Tupper Wizards in the beginning was we, we mined like one big four megabyte block, one four megabyte transaction, a single transaction that had this massive JPEG file inside it. And that blew a lot of people's minds because they didn't think it was possible. Um, so that's what inscriptions are. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, a bunch of times they come with those kind of incentive schemes, right? So like with BRC20, you were kind of, people are incentivized to create those inscriptions because that's how they claim the BRC20 tokens. And they, of course, believe they'll go up in value, so they do it. And that ends up filling up blocks. And I think in other chains, people have looked at that and they're like, hey, maybe we should do some incentivization schemes to have people fill up our blocks too, because then it looks like the chain is being used. <laughs> and um, so a bunch of people have done that. <laughs> yep, they sure have. Uh, and sometimes <laughs> it takes them down. But I'm curious, maybe if, if we take a step back here, you, you mentioned how Bitcoin kind of, some of the people, obviously not all of them, maybe turned to some laser eye cult members, and then you wanted to make an NFT that would actually appeal to Bitcoiners. What is it that makes, like when, when you think about that as like maybe a product person, how, how do you think about that? Like what what is it that some that, that makes something more appealing to Bitcoin people than to Ethereum or Solana people in terms of NFTs? other than the fact that it's literally on Bitcoin. Right. So I think, look, there's a bunch of things that I think different people find different kind of benefits to speak to them. Um, one is that they're, we talked about this a bit before, they're kind of uniquely Bitcoin in the sense that they're immutable, like they're truly immutable and the data is on chain and the, the issuer don't, no longer has any control after the NFTs are issued. So that's one thing. It kind of, kind of hits the kind of Bitcoin ethos in a way that, that I think some people like, um, but also, you know, Tupper Wizards themselves are based on a, on a meme from 2013, uh, which is the Bitcoin wizard meme, which is a really cool story. You know, if we, if we go back to 2013, you know, most people didn't know what the word Bitcoin even meant, right? They probably never heard that. And the few people who did assumed that it was some, you know, something that criminals use, right? Like you use it to buy drugs or whatever. Um, so it had a pretty massive branding problem at the time. Most people didn't know it existed and the few who did thought it was for criminals, not great. So what, uh, some people who were kind of Bitcoiners did, they, they were trying to promote the Bitcoin subreddit. That was where people were talking about Bitcoin at the time. So they're trying to promote the Bitcoin subreddit to the greater Reddit community and what they did is they did a contest. They were like, hey, let's come up with an ad. And someone posted this ad <laughs> that basically looks like a, a wizard drawn in Microsoft Paint. That's what it looks like. Um, very silly. It says magic enter money and join us and that's it. And it's, it's look like, it looks like super silly. But that ad ended up, at least at the time, being the most successful Reddit ad ever at the time in 2013. So it, it did better than all the other ads on Reddit before. Um, people just loved it. And it, actually a ton of people that you talk to uh, who were in Bitcoin at the time would tell you that the way they got into Bitcoin is because they saw that ad. So it's like this infamous, crazy, stupid ad. It's a cool story. Um, it's a cool meme. And, and we think that it's like, we think Bitcoin has a similar branding problem today in the sense that it's still, obviously today it's very well known, right? Like you, you'll be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't know what Bitcoin is. But if if people actually look into Bitcoin, at least in the West, usually what they're going to see is a bunch of laser eyes on Twitter that are yelling that you can only eat meat and that you, I don't know, a bunch of like rules and, and laws that have nothing to do with Bitcoin. And people just are like, and you know, you can't, you can't other, own other coin that's a sin, so you can't do that. And a bunch of like crap. The people just look at that and they say, okay, these guys are crazy. And they, best case scenario, they move on to Ethereum and Solana. Worst case, they just fuck off. So we're like, okay, there is a branding people because those people- Or they become like a, Steven Deal or Nassim Taleb and just make yeah. it their personality to shit on Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's really- <laughs> That's 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 probably the worst case. So 
you know, we were looking at that. We we're like thinking, okay, these guys, the laser I called, there's it's small. It's not really the majority of Bitcoiners. Most, most Bitcoiners are not like that at all. Um, but when people look at it, that's what they think that Bitcoin is. So that's a branding problem. And if you want to fix the branding problem, you need to put, you know, an alternative face for Bitcoin out there. And that's kind of where we're going with this. And I think a lot of people in the Bitcoin community were like, hey, you know what? Like, yeah, we fucking do need this. Like, this is actually something important we need to support. And also, I think for a lot of people in kind of the, the greater crypto ecosystem, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm like almost ashamed of really is that I think in the last two years, most people who got into crypto in since 2021, I would say probably didn't touch Bitcoin at all. Like never got a Bitcoin wallet, never bought any because there was no interesting opportunity to play around with, right? So people are like, okay, I don't know. NFTs and DeFi and other chains and that's it. They're not even thinking about getting BTC. They're like, oh, it's too expensive and there's nothing for me to do there and they just move on. And I think that's shameful. Like that's absurd. Like, And it's it's also like, Really unfortunate. I think that everyone in crypto should have at least some exposure to to Bitcoin, right? Um, I would say, like, if you're in crypto and you don't have like at least like five percent exposure to Bitcoin or something, then I don't know what you're doing with your life. <laughs> like, that's absurd. So, but but the 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 way that this was that Bitcoin has been branded over the last few years just made it like uninteresting. So what we've seen is is as you you know obviously and this should be obvious is you give people something to play with that they can get into like these BRC20s and those inscriptions, then they're suddenly like, okay, yeah, I do want to play around with Bitcoin. Sure, I, I, I might spend more time on Solana, but but this is like, this looks like a cool opportunity. So that's that's really what we're going after. And, you know, we weren't sure in the beginning, but it worked uh, well, way better than we expected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, you made some very good points there. Uh, it, it is fascinating to me as somebody who, um, Maybe start with Bitcoin and then just uh, as maybe more with Solana Maxi these days. Um, I, I would say like it's not clear to me what percent of Bitcoin, what percent of the Bitcoin community still feels like the 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 laser eye cult mentality, and then what percent are actually like okay, I'm sick of this. Um, we need to do something about the chain. So that's my first question. Like, what what would you say the relative percentages there are? And two, and this is a harder question and I think we asked this to Nick Carter and Balaji too on the, on the on the show, which is how did this happen? Like wh why? Because you realized early on, or I don't know, at some point you're like, okay, there's something weird here with this with this cult. We need to change something. What made you have that realization, and and why don't other people have it? I'll start with the second question. Like I was late. Um, I was knee deep deep in the cult for many years. I think I only started like looking outside of the cult two years ago. Um, one of the reasons that I'm yelling off the rooftops is, look, I, I really do genuinely believe it's a cult. I'm not like, it's not a joke. It is a cult. It, it, it's, it's, it, it fulfills all of the conditions of being a cult. And I think a lot of times in real life, uh, when you meet someone who's an actual cult survivor, they'll tell you like, what do you want to do with your life? I want to make sure that other people don't get into the cult. <laughs> That's like, it's, it's because I really think it's bad. Like, I think it's unhealthy. It's unhealthy for Bitcoin. It's especially unhealthy for the members of the cult. Um, so, yeah, I just think it's an important thing to talk about. And I've, I'm seeing the same thing in Ethereum these days and in a bunch of other ecosystems. So it's like, I, I think it's important. It's like an important topic. But, but, but more than that, like, you know, there's... Like everything, I think it started in in with good intentions. I think around 2017, especially, there were just so many scams, man. There were so many scams. Like 2017 with all of the ICOs, it was just, uh, it was ugly. Really, it was. And I think a lot of people got burned. Um, people who were already in Bitcoin in 2017 and went into these ICOs and they got burned badly. And I think a lot of this kind of laser eye cold thing was kind of a reaction to that, where people were basically just, you know, trying to defend the tribe and saying like, okay, whoever's, if someone's raising uh, money for a crypto project, they're probably a scammer. And in 2017, that was a pretty good heuristic, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think at some point we missed the signs that things are changing and it's no longer just scams. Now, to be clear, I would say the crypto is still like 95% plus scams. 
Um, but it's not 100% anymore. And I think we, we missed the transition as Bitcoin maximalists, right? We missed the transition from, hey, it's all scams to it's no longer all scams. And that, you know, that was a mistake. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't anyone's bad intention. It was just a mistake. And then it kept reinforcing itself um, to, you know, at some point it just cope. <laughs> you know, at some point it just becomes cope. You're like, oh, wh- why are Ethereum people making money? Why are Solana people making money? Why is everyone making money? And Bitcoin is only up uh, 100% in three years. What's going on? You know, so it's just it just becomes cope. And at some point you're like, you can't stop it. People are like obsessed and (laughs) and completely out of their minds. I think that's roughly what's going on there. But if to the question of like percentages and stuff, you know, I think the laser eye cult is no bigger than 5% of Bitcoiners. And it's probably I don't I can't have hard numbers, right? It's probably much smaller than 5%. I'm saying a 5% is like an extreme exaggeration. It's probably way, way smaller than that. Most Bitcoiners that I know from the time that I kind of became a Bitcoin holder um, are not like that at all. Not even like, you know, look, who 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 bought into the Ethereum ICO? Exclusively Bitcoiners. There was no one else. <laughs> Everyone who got into the, 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 all of 100% of the early Ethereum people are Bitcoiners, right? All of them. <laughs> um, I think I'm, I know a ton of like, big Bitcoin supporters who are also big Solana supporters. Um, it's like, it's very common for Bitcoin. Like, how do you become a Bitcoin, an early Bitcoiner in the first place? It's because you're open-minded and you like experimenting with stuff. Otherwise, you're not going to become an early Bitcoiner, right? So, of course, for the majority of those people, they're not like that at all. And I think Rudy, when, the, when you say yeah. that, though, I think it's interesting because like two adjectives that I think of with Bitcoin, which I am a fan, but I think of Doomer, <laughs> and boomer, right? Like yep. older and people think that, that the world's going to end, even though you just described it as people got involved with Bitcoin who were more exploratory, you know, wanted to get involved with the tech, crypt- cryptography, which is true. Like people in my college uh, that were early to Bitcoin were those type of people. So I'm curious, you know, where did that go wrong? And and one thing I really like about you, I've heard you describe yourself as more of a storyteller and that Taproot Wizards allows you to show, not just tell. Like you don't just have podcasters talking about why the world's going to end and you should use Bitcoin. Instead, it like shows people a thing to be optimistic about and they might get involved with Bitcoin afterwards. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I think, I think you know, that's the branding problem I was talking about, right? Like, yeah, I know. Like when you look at Bitcoin, anyone who's not part of the Bitcoin ecosystem and looking from the outside into Bitcoin, they're like, yeah, these are like boomers, preppers, right? Like they're, they're, they're like sitting in their like um, um, underground like basement with like nuclear defenses or whatnot and ready for the world to go kaboom and sit on their fucking Bitcoin and tell everyone that they told them so, right? Like that's that's what they look like. They look they look like gold bugs, essentially. Like the digital gold bugs, right? And the thing is, it's not true. You know, like, yeah, there's a bunch of those. There's like maybe 10,000, 20,000 people like that, right? But there's 100 million Bitcoin holders, you know? So... So there's there's an, there was this interesting um, uh, research paper, I think by Grayscale, in uh, I think it was last year in 2022, if I remember correctly. And they basically set out to find, in the U.S. specifically, how many how many Bitcoin holders also have other coins. What do you think, like percentage wise, what do you think the number is going to be? Eighty percent. Yeah, so eighty-seven percent, eighty-seven percent of Bitcoin holders in the U.S. also own other crypto coins, right? So, because of course they do. I mean, it's absurd. Why wouldn't they? <laughs> right? Like, of course they do. And only only thirteen percent only have Bitcoin. And now, out of those thirteen percent, I would assume the majority is not for ideological reasons. It's not for religious reasons. It's not because they think that Ethereum is a sin. They just you know, they happen to look into Bitcoin, they bought some and they moved on with their lives, you know, and it's sitting sitting in their Coinbase account or in their Trezor or whatever it is. And that's it. Um, but it's not because they're ideological about it. So how many people are actually ideological about you? You may only own Bitcoin if you own anything else, you're a sinner. Yeah, I'm sure it's less than 5%. That's, I believe that. It is interesting though, because the things that you see most on the interwebs 
right? Uh, Reddit and uh, Twitter are usually the laser guys um, because they tend to get the most attention or at least controversy. And, and so it ends up spreading. Do you think that ever changes? Like what, what do you think? Or I guess maybe a, a better question is how do you see that playing out in the next five to 10 years? Do you think that's always remains there? Yeah. So if you, you know, if you, if we, if you'd asked me the same question a year ago, I was almost ready to lose hope. Um, it was difficult to see what was going to change it. I thought it was clearly damaging both to those people themselves and also to Bitcoin as a as a movement, as an as an, an and as an asset, really. But I didn't know what changes it, right? So, what happened with Ornolds, though? I think. I think the most important and interesting thing that happened there is that it really opened people's minds as to what is possible with Bitcoin. A year ago, people would be like, well, you can't build X on Bitcoin because Bitcoin cannot support it. And I think that now the people have seen a lot of stuff built on Bitcoin within a, a single year. People are like, well, you know what? Probably everything has happened if we go and build it. <laughs> everything is possible if we build it, right? Um, and I think that just really changed the approach. Like one of the problems, you know, you asked before, how did this happen? I think the reason the laser eyes got got to this kind of prominent position is because there was nothing else to talk about, you know, on Bitcoin. Like what else would you talk about? So who became the people who became popular are the people who, you know, they talk about macro conditions all day. They talk about Bitcoin as a way of life and and how it will, you know, what, what you need to eat and how you need to ed educate your children in order to be a true Bitcoiner because there was nothing else to talk about. You look at other chains, obviously, who's the, you know, who are the kind of figures that you look up to on other ecosystems? It's usually builders, founders, you know, entrepreneurs, traders sometimes, but it's people who go out there and do shit and have, you know, interesting, uh, both interesting opinions, but also actual accomplishments and people look up to them because they did something, right? And on Bitcoin, because nobody did anything, you didn't have people to look up to who are like that, right? And I think that what happened in the last year is people are like, well, you know, actually, here's a group of people who made a ton of money on Bitcoin. Here's a, ton, here's a group of people who created something. Here's a group of people who built a marketplace that people are using, you know? So actually, those people are a lot more interesting than some podcaster who's rambling about diet, right? So I think that's making like a very deep cultural change in what Bitcoin is, you know? So I'm I'm super bullish now. I was like really about to give up. <laughs> and now I'm I'm I I don't think I've I've look, I've been in Bitcoin ten years. I don't think I've been this bullish ever. Oh wow. Okay. That's uh that's that's interesting uh, alpha for for some of the Solana listeners. Quick break to tell you about an upcoming event I promise you don't want to miss. It's Blockworks biggest and best institutional conference called Das London. It's a two-day event happening in London this March. Where we're going to have over 700 institutions, 130 speakers and a couple thousand of us all under one roof. Crypto is in a position for the first time to actually onboard these institutions and they're showing up. We have companies from BlackRock to Visa launching real products in the space. We have the real world asset narrative taking off. We have things like payments that have been exponentially growing and then we have things like deep end happening in the Solana ecosystem. There's a ton of capital right now in this institutional space. It's going to be coming on chain. It's going to completely change the industry. Whether you are an institution or you're a retail user or you just want to learn more about what's going on in the space, this conference is for you. You're going to be able to meet some of the best and smartest people in the space. The speaker lineup is absolutely incredible and you'll get to hang out with me. But the best part is you actually get 20% off your ticket if you use Lightspeed 20 when checking out. That's Lightspeed 20. I put a link in the show notes. Um, I recommend buying this today because one, you'll forget about it. Two, these ticket prices go up every single month. So anyways, I hope to see you there. Now, let's get back to the show. So I, so I am curious, actually. Um, th there's actually more than uh, ordinals. And and uh, like there's actually, when I last looked, you, you guys are even talking about, I mean, obviously there's Stacks, there's Lightning Network. There's even talk of L2s on Bitcoin. Can you, um, where I want to approach this from is our audience probably doesn't know Bitcoin too much. They're probably going to be Solana or Ethereum people. Right. Can you maybe do like a lightning summary of those developments and what what's it going on in Bitcoin land and that's not just holding the coin? Yeah, yeah, sure. I would say so. A lot of those things, I would say most of those things are very early. Lightning has been around for a long time, and I would I feel comfortable saying that Lightning has been a failure. 
a lot of Bitcoin people would be annoyed with me for saying that, but I think that's pretty self-apparent. And you know, nobody's using it; nobody gives a shit. So I would say that has not succeeded. Um, but uh, there's also, you know, I think what, what again, what's changing in the last year is people are like, well, you know, we can try other stuff, and you know. One reason I really like your criticism about uh, layer twos on Ethereum word because I think they're true. Um, what's really interesting in the context of Bitcoin, though, that a layer two or a roll up is actually something completely different, because a roll up in the context of Ethereum, you're obviously only talking about scaling, right? Like th that's what a roll up does in the context of Ethereum, and. And yeah, when you start thinking about it, it has a problem like fracturing liquidity and a bunch of other issues that that creates. Um, from the Bitcoin point of view, a rollup is not mainly about scaling. A rollup is really about adding functionality because Bitcoin does not have a VM. It doesn't. Or you could you could say that the Bitcoin script is a very basic VM, but that's not an interesting thing to say. So you know, yeah, it's not Bitcoin, complete. Yeah. Bitcoin doesn't have like a serious real VM. And if you add a rollup on top, then now you can use the Bitcoin asset in a VM in, in a somewhat trust minimized way. So in the context of Bitcoin, a rollup doesn't just add scale in some broken way. It actually makes Bitcoin more functional and allows people to do more things with Bitcoin. So I actually think that the rollup design is a much better fit to Bitcoin than it is for Ethereum. Um, Bitcoin also has this, you know, Unlike Ethereum, Bitcoin really cannot change a lot. Like it's really hard to change Bitcoin, make upgrades to the kind of base layer. Um, and I think we probably would be able to get a few small upgrades in, but we're not gonna, you know, no one's gonna turn Bitcoin into Solana. That 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 ship has sailed a long, long time ago. Um, Bitcoin is gonna remain very similar to its architecture today. So building in layers on top of Bitcoin makes sense because that's the only thing you can do <laughs> in terms of Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, I think that a rollup on Bitcoin actually makes way more sense than a rollup on Ethereum. And I, I assume that the way it would go is that those roll, there, 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 it's very likely there would be one rollup and not 50. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not a way to decentralize things or to scale them. It's probably going to remain very expensive to use that rollup probably, but at least you would be able to use BTC and smart contracts if you really wanted to. So so it, it's not going to be, you know, I, I don't ever see Bitcoin becoming like a platform, like a mainstream platform where, you know, where they build the next Instagram on top of it or something like that. That's, I don't think ever is going to happen. But if people want to, you know, build um, a marketplace for high end NFTs, like very high end NFTs where the velocity is kind of low, then yeah, maybe I think that could work. Um, Do you do you see a future at all where ordinals become a large percent, a continual large percent of the Bitcoin block? Because let me know if these numbers are right, but I think fees are up like 300 times yeah. since ordinals have come out. Um, I have some numbers here. It's like 48 million ordinals in total have been, I guess, minted is what we would call it in Solana or Ethereum. Um, and then it's about, I think, 160 or 260 million in fees, which you know a lot of people know that Bitcoin does right now have a long-term fee problem potentially. So I'm just curious, where do you see that going? Do you think ordinals will be a larger and larger percentage of what Bitcoin is? Yeah, I suspect it's going to continue. Yeah. Um, I think like the way I'm looking at it, look, of course, some people are not going to like that, but the way I'm looking at it is I assume, I think there's a high probability that Bitcoin ends up becoming like a playground for basically rich people, you know, who have, who are able to pay very high fees. And in return, they get to play around with those kind of luxury items. Um, and I, I assume that's probably what's going to happen. And I view things like Solana as what everyone else is going to use. Like the vast majority of people are probably going to use, right? And and that's awesome. And then I look at Ethereum and I'm like, well, what is Ethereum for then? Because <laughs> most people are going to use Solana, Bitcoin is, I believe, is going to be kind of the luxury end of the spectrum. And then what, what the, what the heck is Ethereum for? I, I don't see, I genuinely don't know, but we'll find out. <laughs> How do you feel about Bitcoin being exported to other chains? Let's just say to Solana. And I know you lose some of the security of Bitcoin, but like, do you feel positively? And how does the rest of the community feel about that? 
Yeah, I mean, it depends on who you ask, right? I think WBTC on Ethereum has been pretty popular, right? Like, um, it's 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 fairly popular on DeFi apps. Um, so obviously, there is a market for that. Um, I would have preferred to use Solana for those things than Ethereum, but also, you know, the the last time someone tried to tokenize Bitcoin on Solana, it was FTX, and that didn't end really the best way possible. So, like, hopefully, next the next one will be better. I think. Um, you know, it, it depends on who you ask, but I think one of the one of the things I'm pretty sure there are going to happen is that Bitcoin will end up at least having the ability to bridge in a you know more trust minimized way to other chains. Today, it's like really fully trusted bridges, but I think that Bitcoin will receive the upgrades that are necessary in order to at least remove some of those trust assumptions so that it, you can easily bridge it to other chains. I think that's something that will happen. What do you think, or what do you see as, as somebody that's obviously pretty active in the Bitcoin community? What, what, what do you want the chain to look like in five to 10 years, right? Like, let's say we're even more boomer now. Um, <laughs> we're, yeah. looking, we're, we're looking at the chain. What, what do you want to see? Like, what's the ideal state? Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's where I see it as kind of the luxury DeFi NFC playground. I think that's why it's going to be, which means you know we're not going to have millions of transactions uh, per minute or anything like that. I think it's going to remain at something like four thousand transactions every ten minute block, like it is today, same ballpark. Um, but I think just the value in those transactions is going to grow a lot. Um, and yeah, the other thing, you know, we, we we just happen to just talk about those two things. But I think the other thing is BTC itself as an asset, I think, can be very valuable in other chains. And I I, I think that's something that's going to happen a lot, that people bridge their Bitcoin to other assets. Because look, it's, at the end of the day, I think especially people who are, you know, people talk about institutions, and I think it's true for institutions, but I think it, it's also true for a lot, a lot of types of like just whales and just people who sit on a lot of crypto i think for a lot of them they do prefer to have you know a large portion of their portfolio in bitcoin just because they consider it to be more stable more reliable and you know less risky um so i think for like these kind of big wallets it makes sense to maintain btc but maybe they maybe they still want to deposit it into some you know lending app in in Solana. So I think that that functionality is going to be pretty important. I don't like when people talk about layer 2s or bitcoin I'm like yeah okay fine like whatever but like the I don't see a difference between I think that's probably something we agree on Mert. <laughs> I don't see a difference between like the term layer 2 and just a, a blockchain <laughs> right it's just just marketing speak. So if someone wants to use bitcoin on ethereum or solana instead of on a Bitcoin layer two, I don't see the difference. Like whatever, it's the same product wise and conceptually it's the same thing. So I think Bitcoin would allow for those kind of things. And just as a financial asset, look, Bitcoin is a trillion dollar financial asset now. It's a grown up and we're, we're looking at an ETF that I'm pretty convinced is going to happen imminently. So it's just a serious asset that people are going to have in their portfolios and they're going to want to use it everywhere is what I think. Got one thing to add in here, Mark, because I saw you react to that. Um, one thing that I do think, like with L2s that Ethereum has that maybe Bitcoin doesn't, is one, just the developers. So, you know, Bitcoin isn't known. It's more stagnant, if you, as you've described it. It's actually encouraged people not to change Bitcoin at yeah. all. And so a lot of those developers have gone to Ethereum. And, you know, in Solana land, we talk about why velocity and efficiency is much more important than TVL. Uh, Ethereum has very high TVL. And I think that's true, but also that TVL attracts de attracts developers and also L2s because they know they can get some of that TVL into their L2. I mean, we've seen what happened with Blast, like 700 million, right. they don't even have a product. So how do you how do you get that to change on Bitcoin? Because you need both those users and that developer mentality to change. Yeah, look, uh, luckily there's a trillion dollars in TVL on, on Bitcoin right now, right? So like the 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 trick is to get to get a portion of that to kind of start mobilizing, right? There's a lot of like dormant t TVL on Bitcoin and the trick is to get this to start moving and, and to get people to start allocating. And look what we've seen in the last year is that it's happening, right? Like it's happening in I think way faster than we expected. So I think 
I, th- I do think that trend will continue to a point that eventually people will be like, well, actually, if you're looking for the highest DVL, that's probably a Bitcoin and not Ethereum. Um, we're not there yet. Not for real. Like there's, there's definitely more value on the Bitcoin chain, but it's dormant. And I think that that's a lot of those dormant coins are going to become active soon. One thing I'm curious about is, um, and I can kind of maybe pattern match based on what, what your answers this episode, but one thing I'm curious about is how Bitcoin people see, and obviously this depends on the person, but maybe you personally see the entire industry right now in crypto. And what I mean by that is it's like, honestly, it's quite complex. Like you you enter and then you hear, well, there's Bitcoin, but then there's Ethereum, there's L2s, there's L3s. Some of those L2s use Celestia. Some of those layer twos are ZKs. Oh, and then there's Solana. And then actually there's also Cosmos and AppChains. So there's like quite a bit going on. And then now there's Aptos and Sui. What, like, how, how, do you, how do you think about this as somebody who's like quite early to the space? Did you see this coming? Like any, did you see like any hints of a future like this at the time? I did not think it would turn out that way. No, I thought that, um, I thought it would be too complicated for people to, to, to care. Right. And like, oh, there were always like projects talking about like very, like things that seemed like really out there and layer twos and layer threes. But it, it, I always assume that it will be like, well, I don't like, I can't wrap my head around it. I just don't care as, as I thought what people would think. But uh, clearly that's not what happened. Um, I, th- I think though, you know, at the end of the day, obviously, look, obviously the main use case of crypto right now is, is gambling, right? Like that's, I think that's pretty clear. Um, but if we, if we look a step beyond that, then I think people also want to hold assets and different people have different preferences for different types of assets. Not everyone is necessarily going to the extreme end of the risk curve. Like, sure, bonk is fun, but like, you know, <laughs> some people prefer something that's a little more uh, grounded, right? And so I, I think if I had to guess, and I've been wrong so many times before, so who the fuck knows? But if I had to guess, I think that if we're going to, you know, kind of break through into like the billion user stuff that people are talking about sometimes, if we're going to get there, I don't think that people are going to know what chain they're using and what's the tech behind it. It just doesn't make sense to me that everyone will be that deeply into it. And there's there's probably two things they're going to know. One is which asset I own. And two is maybe like which app or game am I playing or whatnot. And I don't think they're going to interface with those things with like, five different wallets and I, I just don't see that happening. So maybe we just don't get to a billion people, maybe. But if we do, I think that it's a lot of this stuff is going to have to be kind of uh, abstracted out probably. Do you see Taproot Wizards becoming something more than just an NFT project? And, um, you know, you've, you've seen Bonk and a lot of people think Bonk and other NFTs, for example, and Solana and also Ethereum, that if you own one of those NFTs, you'll get airdrops and you'll be recognized by other communities. And I'm sure that could happen with Taproot. But also you see some of these NFT projects expanding into other things. Like, do you want to do that at all? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we announced stories, um, I think it was a month ago. And the goal with that is not to just draw draw more JPEGs. Like we we think that that same community that is like kind of has been pushing Bitcoin forward in the last year, we think that that same community will be able to really like, you know, we talked about stuff like roll-ups and a bunch of other things that need to happen in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And we think that, we think we need to go out and build it is the, you know, the TLDR. Like I don't think anyone else will if we, if we, <laughs> if we don't start pushing it forward. And I think that once that happens, um, I think Bitcoin is going to become much more competitive as an ecosystem. So we just we just believe that like there's this there's this gap between Bitcoin right now and you know Ethereum and other ecosystems. And I think that a big percentage, a big chunk of that gap is going to be closed. Not all of it, but but some of it, right? And I think there's a ton of opportunity in just building what is necessary to at least make that gap smaller. Um, again, because, you know, we talked about how it's a trillion dollar ecosystem and some of that, some of that is going to become active. So, yeah, 
we think there's a lot more to, to do there beyond just JPEGs. Absolutely. I'm just thinking in my head, it'd be pretty creative to see if you could do this cryptogra- with cryptography. If you're a Solana project and you want to target Bitcoiners that probably do have a lot of capital that's been idle, you could target those addresses that own, for example, a Taproot Wizard and say somehow if you can cryptographically link your Bitcoin, a Bitcoin address, we have a wallet waiting for you with an airdrop of our token over in Solana. So that'd be a pretty cool acquisition strategy. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, in general, I think we're going to see a lot more of this kind of cross-chain things, right? Like there is a, it's, it, it culturally, it's like, it's funny, like when you have Bitcoin and Ethereum has this massive rivalry and Ethereum and Solana has this massive rivalry, but it's only, it's always, it's only one generation. It never lasts for two generations. So like, I, I don't know a lot of Bitcoin people who are particularly upset about Solana and vice versa. And I think that uh, as those generations like continue, I think you're going to continue to see that there's going to be a lot of communities that are happy to cooperate between themselves. Um, it's only like the stupid rivalries between the edges that are like, yeah, but th- those are not, you know, I don't think that's going to be um, what stops cooperation between like these networks. So I posted before, one minute before the episode, I was like, okay, chat, show me some questions for Rudy. Uh, and none of them are really good. They're really pretty weird. Like when Bitcoin SVM roll up <laughs> or, or when Solana Wizards or when SVM on Bitcoin dog or fat cat. Anyway, so that is all to say. I do. I am curious, though, because uh, you're a big Twitter user. Um, how do you first of all, what do you think about the app uh, and, and how do you use it in the context of crypto? Like, Because um, I, I know people have uh, d- different different views on this. Yeah, look, you're, you you hit the nail on the head. Like, uh, Twitter is mental illness. So I think anyone who's using it uh, frequently is not well. I'm definitely in that group. Um, you can tell yourself, like, oh no, I use it for like market research, and I it's it's marketing, and it's a uh, it's a uh, no, no, it's just it's just a form of sickness. But but also look, also. Um, I, I, I honestly, I don't think crypto would exist without it, right? Like we we do need a place to congregate. Um, maybe it could, maybe it would have been something else instead of Twitter. But there, there's definitely needs to be a social layer where people interact. I think that's really that's really what we're doing in crypto, and all of the blockchain stuff on top of it is kind of, you know, just to make things easier. But if we had to, we would have done it with spreadsheets. Which, by the way, you know, in Ornals, that's what we've done in the in the first month before we had marketplaces and wallets built out, we literally just said, okay, we're inscribing this and here's a spreadsheet that we write down who owns what and you can buy your position in the spreadsheet. And eventually when we figure out the technical parts, we'll stop using the spreadsheet, which is what happened. But yeah, I think that's what we would have done. You know, we would have used a spreadsheet for Bonk and we would have said like who owns what and just trade it there if we had to, right? But the the social layer behind that is what really counts if you ask me. Gary, do you do you have any final questions before I do some rapid fire? Yeah, I just got financial advice questions for you, Udi. <laughs> We've got the ETF coming up. What do you think about it? I mean, it doesn't have to be from a price perspective, but how do you think that's going to change either the community or how people think about Bitcoin or or how do you think it's going to change the demand for it? Any thoughts? My main assumption during the year and look, it could still turn out wrong, but my main assumption during the year was that we're going to see the price run up towards the ETF approval. And from there, from there on, I'm not as sure. Um, <laughs> Thank so, you. you know, gladly the first part came true. Now I hope that I'm wrong about the second part. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, it's not, it's not that I think that necessarily everything's going to crash. It's more that I just don't, it's, I view it as kind of a singularity event that I don't really have a strong opinion about what happens next. Whereas I felt like it was pretty easy to tell what was going to happen before. <laughs> so now that, that most of that, I think kind of played out, it's now it's like, yeah, honestly, I don't, I don't have a strong opinion anymore. I don't know. Um, if I, like, if I completely have to guess, like I would say like, yeah, you know, like, Probably, maybe, like, you know, you see some kind of a blow off top and then you realize that the institutions are not standing in line to buy the ETF. They're like, eventually over, you know, three, four years, I do think that it's a, it's a very important growth engine, but not 
in one week, like some people seem to expect. Like, hey, ETF approves, we go to two million because immediately everyone buys it. Eh, probably not. It is, but it is a very important, like crucial part of the infrastructure that I think over the next few years will probably play a big part. Um, so that's, you know, how I'm thinking about it at least. I think the one interesting thing, though, like, is as you think about the, if you accept that Bitcoin is going to go through a process of financialization to, you know, over multiple years, and it's not like a one week event, but a thing that it's going to take a while, I think you can compare it to the financialization of gold um, in whatever, like three years ago, or whatnot. And I think, I think it's really interesting how the like, you might argue that a lot of the gold value in the world is stored through ETFs, but definitely not most people in the world are 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 interacting with the ETF, right? Like most people don't have the gold ETF, right? Um, but what a lot of people do have is gold jewelry, right? Um, probably the main way that people interact with gold is through jewelry. They have, you know, whatever, necklaces and stuff, and it's made of gold. And that's when they think of the world, word gold, that's why they think, even though the majority of the gold value is financialized. And I think it might be similar with Bitcoin. I'm, and, and I'm not talking about like a month from now, but kind of years into the future. I think that might be a similar case where Bitcoin becomes very institutionalized and financialized, but most people end up interacting with it through stuff like ordinals and inscriptions, like kind of art and more creative kind of stuff that they can flex. Um, I think that's a very possible outcome. So that's why I, that's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in that. I think like, you know, if, if you, if you, if we go into a world where Bitcoin is viewed as, as truly digital gold, just a digital version of gold. then I think the way they flex it is not by saying, Hey, I have half a BTC in my wallet. It's more by saying, "Hey, look at my cool JPEGs." I think that makes more sense. All right, time for rapid fire. Uh, I am caffeinated today, so I'll, I will be asking these fast. All right, favorite NFT that's not on Bitcoin? Mad Lads. Well, Mad Lads and CryptoPunks. Those are the two, obviously. CryptoPunk has their place, but in the last year, like Mad Lads, I think are killing it. Favorite app that's not on Bitcoin? Man, I don't know. They're all shit. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, if you had to uh, recommend people follow someone to keep up with Bitcoin, that's not you. Who would it be? Hmm. Man, that's a that's a tough one. You know, that's a that's actually a tough one because. Um, interesting recommendation that people would not expect. Maybe Dylan Leclerc. He's um he's kind of almost in the laser eye camp, and I disagree with him with a lot of stuff. But I think he's kind of fresh and knows how to appeal to a lot of people. So I think he's a good first follow. Okay. Um, what do you hate the most about crypto? Man, it's just so much scams, man, and it's. <laughs> It's very scammy, and it's just that there's a. It's clearly unhealthy, right? It's not healthy to be in crypto. We agree on that, right? It's not, you know. I would not recommend it, you know. <laughs> but once once you're hooked, you're hooked. What do you love the most about crypto? Uh, the risk. The risk taking is fun. I don't know. It's fun, living on the edge. What do you think? Or what is your most unpopular opinion that you think is true about the industry? Mm, yeah, it's probably it's probably this about uh, how I think Bitcoin is going to catch up with with the other ecosystems. I think Bitcoin is going to be kind of unrecognizable in a couple of years from now, and people will be like, "Wait, this is? Are you telling me that two years ago there was nothing else to do with it other than holding it in Coinbase? Impossible." So, I really believe that's going to happen. What are your three? top ecosystems outside of Bitcoin? Eh, I don't know, man. Like Ethereum, Solana, what else is there? I don't right. know. I, I don't know. What do you think about... I think Binance uh, is cool. Binance onboarded a ton of people into crypto. 
What, what do you think about like some of those earlier, um, like uh, uh, proof of work, uh, like like Litecoin and stuff? What, what do people generally think about those? I know like you know uh, they're, they're kind of memes, but I'm, I'm curious if there's um, like what you think about them. I mean, they were necessary. Um, I think a lot of um, what went into the Ethereum design started through like all those proof of work altcoins, but I don't know if there's a point in them anymore, right? Like. Yeah, they're just memes. Udi, what, what's something that you've learned now that you're leading a brand that, you know, you didn't know before? Yeah, I think I think it's mainly mainly like the storytelling stuff. And it's that's kind of like an experience that I kind of gained through the years probably. But um yeah, you just, you know, it might be obvious to you guys, but you just don't go and yell at people that you want them to, hey, you need to use self-custody. You need to like use this coin and not that coin. Like that doesn't work. It just doesn't. You need to give people a good story and something to play with if you want them to change their behavior. Um, and it will need to make sense to them. Like it, ha- it, ne- it will need to have value for them and not just for you. <laughs> so that's that's like, that's probably it. What's the number one advice you would give to people looking to build on Bitcoin today? Yeah, just start, man. Like, just start. Like, there's so much opportunity in, like, capital flowing into funding, like, basically anything. Um, just just don't wait. Just don't wait and do it because the I'm 100% certain in the opportunity that is there. And I think, like, it's not going to stay there forever. I think it's going to... The, the gap is going to get closed much sooner than people think. So just start now like today all right i think that's a that's a good place to finish sweet Udi. well this was an awesome conversation I, this is our first bitcoin conversation we've had so uh yeah we're gonna have anyone on you're the person for it man you're very forward thinking uh, in the bitcoin community which you've kind of described doesn't always exist so uh, i'd love you to have <laughs> you man. i'll have to have yeah. you on in another year and actually see you know where bitcoin's gone uh, yeah let's let's see if i if i'm bullshitting or if that was if i was right I'm looking forward to that. Sweet, mate. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Yep. Thanks, guys. See you next time. All right. I've got a little ending note here. First, thank you so much for listening to the full episode. If you really liked it, hit subscribe. But secondly, make sure you sign up for DAS. This is BlockWorks biggest institutional conference happening in London in March. I've included a link in the show notes and also a discount code. Get 20% off. Make sure to use Lightspeed20 when you sign up. All right. I'll see you there. And I'll see you next time on Lightspeed.